Bibles to the book of 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. One verse to get us started tonight. We'll look at a number of verses this evening. I want to deal with the imminent return of Jesus Christ. Now, there's some lessons in this for us. But I believe the strongest argument for why we would be pre-tribulational is because the church obviously believed that Jesus could come back at any time. Now, if Jesus was not going to come until the middle part of the tribulation, then there's no sense in looking for him tonight. It's not going to happen. If you're post-tribulational, you can't believe Jesus could come back tonight. Because we are not in the tribulation. There are some definite things that take place during the tribulation, like the abomination of desolation, the two witnesses, and so on, things like that that are going to take place, that if you believe that the church or that Jesus is not coming back for the church to the end of the tribulation, then you can't be looking for him tonight. If you're post-millennial, that means Jesus couldn't come back for another 1,007 years. There would be no comfort whatsoever to the church with regards to the second coming if Jesus wasn't coming back for a thousand and seven years. So we are pre-tribulational. Tribulation is a seven-year period of time where God pours out His wrath upon the earth. And we are pre-millennial, of course. That's the 1,000-year reign of Christ after He comes back during the revelation of Christ all the way to the earth. Now notice this verse in verse 14. He says thou, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he's writing this book to Timothy, a pastor. He says to Timothy, he says that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, if Jesus wasn't coming back till after millennium, that's a silly statement. I mean, to write to Timothy. You might write it to whoever's around in general down, down the line, but you sure wouldn't write it to Timothy. That thou, you, Timothy, keep this till the appearing. See, Paul didn't know when Jesus was coming back for the church. But he was looking for his coming back. Timothy didn't know when Jesus was coming back for the church, but he's looking for his coming. We're going to look at a number of verses tonight, but let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we come to you now in the name of the Lord Jesus, and how I pray tonight the Spirit of God would get a hold of our hearts about the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ for his people to catch us away to be with him, and how that teaching ought to affect our lives today. And Father, we'll thank you for what you do in our hearts, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me give you just a few verses to start out with. If you want to write them down, that's fine. You may not have time to turn to all of them. But in the gospel accounts, you have verses like Matthew 25, 42. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. Mark chapter 13, beginning in verse 35. Jesus said, Watch ye therefore. For he know not when the master of the house cometh at even, or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. In Luke chapter 12 and verse 40, he says, Be therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh in an hour, when ye think not. In the epistles, 1 Corinthians 1, 7. So that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. In Philippians 3 and verse 20. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior. Notice, we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians 3, verses 4 and 5. Ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 10. And to wait for his Son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Titus 2.13, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. James 5.8, be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Now, it's obvious from the Bible, and I just read a few of the verses dealing with it, from the Bible, uh, 
that Jesus Christ is coming again. Do you realize that there are 1,845 references in the Old Testament to the second coming of Jesus Christ? 17 books give it prominence. In the New Testament, there are 260 chapters in the New Testament. Out of those 260 chapters, there are 318 references to the second coming. Or one out of every 30 verses... For every prophecy of the first coming, there are eight concerning the second coming of Christ. Jesus Christ is coming back. Dr. Lee Robertson gave an illustration of preaching in Jacksonville, Florida one night. He had got done preaching and he was supposed to be leaving early the next morning by plane. As a matter of fact, he had arranged for somebody to pick him up at 3.30. So he set his alarm for 3.30. 15. He got into his motel about midnight. He laid down, couldn't go to sleep, thinking about that alarm. He looked at the clock at 1 a.m., he looked at it at 2 a.m., looked at it at 3 a.m., and was wondering when it was going to wake him up. He said that between 3 and 3.15, it was the longest 15 minutes he'd ever spent in his life. At 3.10, he got up at the edge of the bed and sat there thinking, I wonder what it's going to sound like when it goes off. If you've ever stayed in a motel, you know every one of those motel alarms sound a little bit different. Matter of fact, to me, the hardest time I have sleeping when I'm preaching out is the night before I'm leaving. Not so much in anticipation of being gone as realizing that I need to get up by a certain time in order to get ready to get to the airport on time for the flight. I'm one of those people, I don't want to be late. I don't want to miss my flight and land later some other time. And worry about that all day long. I tell, I tell people when they're going to take me to the airport, get me there early. Because when it starts getting a little late, my stress level begins to rise. Now, I know people who don't mind getting there with 20 minutes to go, running through the airport and all that. That's not me. Dr. Robertson that was that way. And as he sat there on the bed, he said at 3.15 when that alarm went off, it was like it exploded. Shattering the night. Now, truth is, it would have been better for him not to know the time, just wait for the alarm to go off. Uh, But one of the things we know is we know Jesus Christ is coming back. We do not know the day nor the hour. I think there are a number of reasons for that. But let me just simply talk about the imminency of Christ's return tonight. Number one, the imminency of His coming calls for us to be alert. I want you to turn to a couple of verses. Let's look through them. Take a look at Romans chapter 13. I don't know how much longer we have to serve the Lord Jesus here. I don't know how much longer. I do know this. My life's getting a whole lot shorter. I can remember several years ago. Well, it would have been 25 years ago. Laying in bed. We lived in Glenburg Estates in Manchester, Tennessee. I was pastoring Temple Baptist Church. And I remember laying there thinking, man, I'm 35 years old. If God lets me have 70 years, I'm half done. I remember laying there. I can still, I can still picture myself laying there in the bed thinking about 35 years old. If God gives me three score and ten, man, I, I've only, I'm half done. But now I'm 60 years old. And if I get three score and ten, that's just ten more years left. That's not much time. Anything I'm going to get done for Jesus, I've just got 10 years to get it done. Thing is, I have no guarantee of 10, do I? Look what he says in Romans chapter 13, beginning in verse 11. He says, And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. We have no guarantee of three score and ten, but the truth is Jesus Christ could come back tonight. What if this week would be your last week on planet earth and Jesus had come back How would you like to be found when he comes back? Wasting another week? Or having a week that counts 
for God. Turn over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Key verses here dealing with the second coming of Christ and what's going to take place. We'll refer to this passage a couple of times. But in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning at verse 13, he says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Now it sounds to me in just reading that verse that Paul was firmly uh, firmly expecting to be alive and awake when Jesus came back. He looked for His coming every day. He says, For the Lord Himself shall descend from the heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord." Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. When For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of the light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. He is calling for an alertness, Because of this fact, Jesus could come at any time to catch us up to be away with Him. You see, the problem that we have today is the church has become dull of hearing. You see, we we are faced with the dullness of man to spiritual truth. Now, that shouldn't shock us with lost people. Lost people have been dull to spiritual truth forever. They hear the Bible, they they hear of the Bible, and they don't take any knowledge about what it says. But too many times, you see, the problem is that saved people are dull to spiritual truth. He doesn't read his Bible. It sits on the shelf, unread. Isn't it interesting that we have so many Bible helps today? I mean, we've got devotional booklets to help us have daily devotions. We have all kinds of Bible seminars and Bible notebooks and things by, and uh, like uh, uh, private time diaries that we can sit and we're encouraged to write things down. We've got tapes. We can listen to the Bible on CD. Man, back then, each of the books of the Bible were simply letters that were written to the churches. They'd be copied off, and very few churches would have every book of the Bible. And yet here, we've got them in our homes, and it remains unread. We've got it on our computer, it remains unread. We have it on CD, and we have it on cassette tape, and never listen to it. Man, if there's ever a generation that ought to be the most spiritual generation in the history of the church, it ought to be today. But we can go Sunday after Sunday with the great majority of believers never winning a soul to Christ. There are thousands and thousands of Baptist churches every year that never even baptize one convert. That means their pastors don't win anybody, their deacons don't win anybody, their membership wins nobody. With all the Bible helps that we have, we can turn on a radio and hear the Bible. We can turn on a TV and hear the Bible. But we become dull. We become dull to spiritual truth. The Bible says in Psalm 119, 130, The entrance of thy word giveth light. It giveth understanding to the simple. Oh, how how many spend so little time in prayer, begging God for the power of God, 
begging God to bring souls to Himself. Too many do not get active in the work of God, but are content to sit back and just... When they see something's not done, complain about it instead of getting active and seeing to it that things are done. You realize, I don't care what the church is, the only way things get done is if people do it. It takes people to get it done. We're also faced with the dullness of man, not just the spiritual truth, but the spiritual dangers. Doesn't see the pitfalls of life all the time. He's saying, well, I don't see how that's going to hurt me. I don't see what's wrong with that. Well, how are you going to see it if you're not going to get in your Bible and study it and read it? How are you going to see it if you're not going to get active in service and realize what's going on? See, too many times he fails to see the results of sin, even though it's well documented. For instance, just in our own society, you take driving and alcohol. I mean, is there anybody that's not convinced yet that drinking, I mean even a little bit, helps to cause accidents? Well, for that matter, what about texting and driving? Oh, yeah, yeah, everybody else will mess up with that, not me. Everybody else will mess up with the drinking. That'll hurt their lives, but not me. I mean, well documented people still do it. Now, again, I understand the lost people not understanding. But saved people are without excuse. And when it comes to spiritual dangers, man, we've got a book that's true from beginning to end. Not only that, we're faced with the dullness of man to prophesied events. Do you realize that every prophecy concerning the first coming of Jesus Christ was fulfilled literally? The Bible said he'd be born of a virgin. Guess what? He was born of a virgin. The Bible said he'd be born in Bethlehem. And God had Augustus Caesar to make a decree to tax all the world in order to get Mary and Joseph from Nazareth down to Bethlehem. God set everything in motion for the literal fulfillment of Jesus being born in the city of Bethlehem, just like Micah the prophet had prophesied in Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. The New Testament starts out with the book of the generations of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, He had to not only come through the line of Abraham, he had to come through the line of David as well. And then the lineage proves that. I mean, over and over again, you read Psalm 22, written about 1,000 years B.C., and you find a prophecy in Psalm 22 of the crucifixion, even words that the Lord Jesus would say on the cross. Even the truth of how he would be put to death by crucifixion. You can see it clearly described in Psalm 22. Even the part about the soldiers gambling for his garments a thousand years before. I mean, every prophecy fulfilled literally. And yet there are even church groups out there today who think all those prophecies, whether it be Revelation or Daniel or Ezekiel, concerning the second coming, are going to be fulfilled spiritually and not literally. Just blind to spiritual truth. As a matter of fact, keep your hand here. Turn over to 2 Peter chapter 3. Now, we see the world's been been blind to Bible truth as well as uh, Bible fact and truth as well as prophetic truth. For you notice in 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 3, he says, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust. Good night. We've had a president get up and scoff at the Bible. I mean, talk about some things in the Bible and scoff at them. Laugh at them publicly. And notice, in the last days, he's not the only scoffer. There's scoffers all over the place. And the Internet has made it possible for people and just in any locale, to get on and around the world by way of the Internet, scoff God and scoff the Word of God. He goes on and saying, where is the promise of His coming? See, they scoff the second coming. For the fathers fell asleep. Since they fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the Word of God, 
the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. You get that? They are willingly ignorant of the creation. So you go into a highly prestigious place like the Smithsonian, and you'll read about millions and millions of years ago. They have no scientific proof of the millions and millions of years ago. We have a word from the living God that in the beginning God created and they're willingly ignorant. And they're so willingly ignorant, they pass laws to keep His creation from being taught to the young people of this country. Willingly ignorant. It's just like the global warming hoax. Even though there are thousands upon thousands of scientists who say that man-made global warming does not happen. It is not possible. It doesn't happen. And yet still, that's the agenda they push. By the way, just as a side note, I don't know if you pay attention to some of the news on that stuff, but it was just about a month ago or so that Sarkozy, I think he's the prime minister or whatever, president of France, he got up and he said that the world has just 56 days to solve the global warming problem. 56 days. Now, wait a second. And the news today is they've decided, those leaders that are meeting on this global warming thing, they decided to wait till next year to take care of it. I mean, does anybody read those things and think, what a joke? Buddy, if it was that serious, you better take care of it tonight. They're not concerned about it because they know it's false. It's just to pass a political agenda. They're willingly ignorant of biblical truth because the truth is uh, the agenda that they have for their political position is far more important. Follow the money. But go on here. Notice what it says. He says, For they're willingly ignorant of this by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished, But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. You know, there's only one thing that's keeping this all from exploding in a real global warming. And it has nothing to do with recycling. The word of God is what keeps it from happening. That's it. And notice what's going to happen. He says, uh, let's see... Verse 7, let me read that again. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same order, kept in store, reserved unto the fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years. A thousand years is a day. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness. But as long suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. The elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Yes, it's going to explode. Yes, it's going to get too hot for life. Yes, all that's going to take place. But it's not till after Jesus comes back for us. And it's not till after His 1,000 year reign. After all that, that'll take place. And thank God, the God who created the first earth and heaven will create another one. Now, that's just Bible truth. But you see, they are willingly ignorant of spiritual truth. The imminency of His coming calls for alertness. Secondly, it calls for awareness. What do you mean? Well, look at 1 John chapter chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3 and verses 1 and 2. We ought to be aware of our own sinful actions. You'll notice in verse 1, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God, therefore the world knoweth us not, but because it knew Him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him. For we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. If you realize Jesus had come today, right now, this very moment, 
then you'd want your life right with God. I mean, you really believe He could come back today. You really believe He could come back tonight. You wouldn't walk out of this building with sin still in your life. You'd want things to be clean. You'd want things to be right with God. Every man, every man that hath this hope in him purified himself. Now, for a person not to purify himself, he says, no, I don't believe he's coming back tonight, which means you're calling God a liar by your life. The very fact that we'd be willing to hold on to sin, hold on to wickedness, we're saying, God, I don't believe you. Now, I understand the lost people saying that, but saved people don't have any excuse. He said, we're not of the night. He said, now it's high time to wake out of sleep. It's time to wake up. Man, he's coming. He promised he's coming. Not only that, we ought to be aware of what Christ has done for us. So I mean, man, he saved us. He saved me from sin. That ought to mean something. You've been born again. Do you realize what Jesus went through to save you? You could go through what, everything he went for you on the cross. How Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, buried, rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Those stripes that he took with the cat of nine tails, that was for me. That was for you. That beating that he took when those soldiers, you realize that there were angels looking over the parapet of heaven who would have loved. I imagine every time he was struck, man, they were saying, let me go, I'll take him out. If one angel could have killed 144,000 of the Midianites in one night, think what one angel could have done just that night alone, as they, that day alone as they saw their one who was their Lord and Master being beaten for our sin. He did that for you. He did that for me. That's why he says in Romans 12, 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable, it's just reasonable service. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Paul had it personal in his life. He said, he loved me and gave himself for me. Man, that ought to make me love him. When I look at what he did for me, not only that, we ought to be aware of the events that will follow when he comes. What do you mean? Well, we read that passage there. For, notice, first of all, great changes. Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 50, uh, 15. We're going to begin in verse 51. Now, I know a lot of people look at this verse, and matter of fact, a lot of churches have put this verse on the wall in their nursery. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. But this is not a nursery verse. He's not talking about policy for the nursery here. We shall not all sleep, meaning we shall not all die. But we shall all be changed. Notice what he says will take place. He says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Now in this passage, he's describing two types of changes. The corruptible putting on incorruption and the mortal putting on immortality. We'll not take the time tonight to go to Acts chapter 2 and read about uh, what Peter preached on the day of Pentecost when it talked about Jesus being in the grave and not corrupting, decaying. What he's saying is here, those bodies that have long since gone to the grave, 
that corruptible will put on incorruption. They'll get a body that will never decay. Man, God's got a new body waiting for us. And he says this mortal will put on immortality. You see, it happens at almost the same time. You say, well, preacher, what is the timing? All right, go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. He says in verse 15, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from the heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. That's the corrupting, putting on incorruption. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. That's the mortal putting on immortality. Where do we meet the Lord? We meet Him in the clouds. Why? In this coming, He's not coming all the way to the earth. When He comes back in Revelation chapter 19, at, uh, at that point, He comes all the way to the earth. And with the word of God that comes from His mouth, He destroys the armies of the world. Sets up His millennial kingdom as He comes all the way to the earth. You see, between that, that first part of His coming, when He comes in the cloud to catch us away, and when He comes all the way to the earth, is that seven-year period called the time of the tribulation. Now that one you'll be able to figure out to the day. After he catches the church away, we know that the Antichrist will then be revealed as to who he is. He will set up his kingdom and he will make a seven-year deal with Israel. Halfway through that, he'll break the treaty. And he will go into the temple that will be built. By the way, you realize that the Jews, if you were to go to a place called the Temple Institute in old Jerusalem today, they have been busy working for the last few decades to prepare for the rebuilding of the third temple. They've got it already. They've even done the priest's garments, just like it is specified in the books of Moses. They've got everything right. The only thing that they have not rebuilt themselves is the Ark of the Covenant. Because according to them, they know where it's at. They're ready. Matter of fact, when we were there, I asked them, I said, How long do you think it would take you to rebuild the temple? They said, Three months. They could have it all rebuilt, sacrifices going, everything. These people are not believers in Jesus Christ. They're not looking for the second coming of Christ. They're simply looking for the opportunity to rebuild the temple. Well, the Antichrist is going to go into that temple for the abomination of desolation halfway through the tribulation period and will set himself up as God. And then there'll be three and a half years left before Jesus comes back. Now, the truth is, if you were sharp from the making of the peace treaty, from according to Daniel chapter 9, beginning in verse 27, making a peace treaty with the... Uh, uh, with Israel, seven years from there till he comes back, it'll probably be seven years from the making of that peace treaty. God even gives us in the book of the Revelation the number of days. Now, all that's already spelled out. The thing he doesn't tell us is when he's coming back to catch us away. That's why the church is never told to be looking for signs. We're to be looking for him. See, you've got a lot of things take place during the time of the tribulation. And the people that are alive then, they get saved during the tribulation. They say, yeah, I see that from the Scripture, and I see that from the Scripture, and that. We can only look at a general condition. If you want to look at some general conditions, all you have to do is read Matthew chapter 24, the words of the Lord Jesus. Read 2 Timothy chapter 3. And the truth is, all those things are true today. They're going on today. But they're not signs that we look for, because the truth is, those things have been going on for a while. It just tells us that we are close to His coming back. doesn't tell us when. No man knows the day or the hour. And when He comes to catch the church away, the only announcement you get is the announcement that you've got right here. This is it. Could be tonight. Could be tonight while I'm sleeping. Wouldn't that be a great way to wake up? Whoo! Gone. That'd be all right. 
be great if it happened right now. But only the saved are getting caught up. Only we who are in the Lord are getting caught up. I've often wondered if Jesus came during the service, how many still be sitting in the pew? That's a scary thought. Think about some young person, man, going home from school. They get to the house. Mama was fixing stuff on the stove. There's stuff on the stove that's cooking. Mama's not at home. She's gone. She's caught up. Imagine what that'd be like. Hey, imagine going to the bathroom during the shake hand song, coming back and... <laughs> only about 15, 20 people are here. And you want to... All right, everybody, what are you doing? Where are you hiding? Some people brain, <laughs> the first thing they think of is, Wally's gotten some people together to scare us, hadn't he? Mm-mm. Jesus would have caught us away. Everybody's not going up. Only those who are his are going up. I mean, really, here. I'm not talking about those who are church members. There are a lot of church members left behind because they never got born again. You understand there are tares among the wheat. Man, this is a pretty exciting story right here. Then we which are alive and remain should be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. What did he say? In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we shall be changed. Whew. I like that. He said, well, what's next then? Well, for us who get caught away, it's the judgment seat of Christ. Turn to it. Turn on. We're talking about up in heaven now. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. He says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. He said, We're going to stand before Jesus at the judgment seat of Christ. It is not going to be a time of offering excuses. It won't be a time of us talking back. It won't be a time of us saying, Jesus, why did you allow this to happen? It'll be a time when you'll be given account for how you spent your time in this body. Now wait, go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He gives us a description of what he's going to be dealing with. Notice, beginning in verse 11. He says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, that is, it shall be made known, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Well, now, what is it that we are sending on to heaven by our works? Well, he told us right back here in verse 12. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stone, those are things that do not burn up in the fire. Or he says wood, hay, and stubble, those are things that burn up in the fire. You do not get the opportunity... To call your wood gold, he's already decided that. And your works will go through his fire. Those that get burned up, that time you've spent in your life, that you spent it on yourself, that you didn't spend it for him, that'll be gone. And that which you spent for him with the right attitude, that'll remain. Notice what he says in verse 15, 14. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So you see, this judgment is not a judgment that determines heaven or hell. The very fact that you're at the judgment seat of Christ means you're going to heaven. But there is a judgment for how you spent your Christian life. Spend it for Him or for yourself. Now, I'm not going to take the time tonight, I've done it not too long ago anyway, dealing with the crowns that believers can win on planet Earth 
to cast at his feet when we get to heaven. But if you're going to have any crowns to cast at his feet, you've got to do it while you're alive here. And the only time you know you've got to earn those crowns is while you're alive here. Either by death or by his coming, man, that's when it all ends and the judgment begins. You give account for the things you've done in this body, whether they be good or bad. And isn't it interesting that the next statement he made there in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. That's not going to be a time, well, I can't wait for this, man, get this thing over with. No, uh there will be terror. I remind you, for those who think that there are no tears in heaven, there will be tears in heaven at the judgment seat of Christ. You see, after the great white throne judgment is when the Bible says that he shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. I believe we'll be weeping when we see loved ones we could have witnessed to cast into the lake of fire. We'll be weeping. He'll wipe those tears away. The time of no tears comes after the great white throne judgment. That takes place after the millennium, after the short season that Satan is loosed, and uh, after that time when the old heaven, the old earth are destroyed. That's when the old tears are wiped away. But let's get back to what we're talking about with the rapture of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, for the lost after the rapture, there's the time of the tribulation. No hope of being saved if they heard the gospel beforehand. Now, this is one of the problems that I had with the Left Behind series of books. To me, it's a major problem. If you saw or read any of the Left Behind books by Brother Tim LaHaye, who, by the way, was an independent Baptist preacher. In the very first book, Left Behind, he has a man who had a saved wife, and a saved son, who you get the impression he had heard the gospel and never accepted it, he gets saved after the rapture in the book. And there's an assistant pastor in the in a church there that had a pastor that preached on the rapture all the time. This guy was an assistant pastor and he wasn't saved. He's left behind and he gets saved in the book. He Listen, that won't happen in real life. Let me show you why. Turn over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. You know, there's some I have no doubt who were thinking when I was giving the illustration, like if during the shake hand song you went to the bathroom and came out, they were going, you said, well, I'd know it was a rapture, I'd get saved then. No, you wouldn't. Because you've heard the gospel here. You've heard it over and over and over again. Now, he talks about some of the things that the Antichrist will do. He says, for instance, in verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, speaking of the rapture, shall not come, except there come a falling away first, the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. You see... He taught about the rapture and the tribulation to the church at Thessalonica during the six weeks he was there. But go down to verse 10. He says, And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. You see, before the rapture of the church, all who hear the gospel presentation, and because they want to stay in their sin, because they don't want to get saved right then, they reject the truth. After the rapture takes place, God Himself will see to it that they are deceived not to get saved after the rapture. Their fate will be sealed. Now, don't misunderstand me. You say, preacher, won't anybody get saved during the tribulation? Yes, multitudes. Do you realize that less than half the world has heard the gospel of Jesus Christ tonight? That means billions of people. 
Man, you've got countries you can't even carry the gospel into today. Do you realize that? You know, there's over 1.6 billion Muslims on planet Earth. The Bible lets us know in Revelation chapter 7 that after the rapture of the church, 144,000 Jews will come to the realization that Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ, is the Messiah. They'll get saved and they'll go out and evangelize many. But everybody who heard the gospel and rejected it before the rapture will believe the lie. I mean, after all, they'll be able to turn on the radio once millions of people have disappeared. And they'll hear churchmen, preachers get up and say, well, it couldn't have been the rapture. We're still here. And they'll deceive many. The Antichrist will help out with his lies and deception. And by the way, if that shocks you, how easily are people deceived today? How many elections do we need to refer to? Why do you think they still run those infomercials? They still make millions off of cheap things that cost you only three easy payments of 1995. Because we're easily deceived. Well, think, think what that's going to be like when God takes his church out. You've got the people who have willingly accepted a lie anyway and rejecting the truth of the Word of God. Easily deceived. But God will do that for those that were in church and rejected the message. Now, that's pretty serious stuff. That's what will follow. We need to be aware of that. Final thing, the imminency of His coming then calls for activity. Go over to John chapter 9. Notice the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in this passage, He's not dealing specifically with the second coming. He's not dealing with the rapture of the church. But in John chapter 9, it says, beginning in verse 1, And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither is this man sin nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. You see, there, come, there is a time to work. By the way, even Ecclesiastes tells us that there is a time to work. Say, when is it? Now. Now's the time while we have the light. We have the light of the Word of God. We have the light of salvation in Jesus Christ. Now is the time... For us to be at work for Him. You remember what Jesus told His disciples in John chapter 4? They had just gone into the city of Sychar to buy meat. They didn't win one person to Jesus. As far as we know, they didn't even tell any of those Samaritans about Jesus. The woman that Jesus met at the well and realized that Jesus was the Messiah, she went into that same town where His disciples, who had seen His miracles, who had heard His teachings went into the same town where they had just been, and she brought the entire city out to Jesus. Jesus said to his disciples, Say not ye there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Can you imagine the excuses they had given Jesus? Well, that's a hard city. Well, Lord, they're Samaritans. They would have not appreciated the message. And yet that woman, new convert, she hadn't seen any miracle from Jesus Christ. She'd only heard just a few words about him having living water. That was it. And she brought the entire city to Jesus. He said, say not ye there yet four months, then cometh harvest. Lift up your eyes. Look on the fields. Behold, they're white, all ready to harvest. Man, if that was true then, think how much more so today with almost seven billion people on planet Earth. The harvest is white. They're out there. I know fields, one field might be a little tougher than the other, but there are people there ready to get saved. I do believe this. I don't care if we're talking about in the morning or afternoon or evening. I don't care if we're talking about the weekend or weekday. I believe at any time there are people simply within the city limit of Madison, Alabama, that if somebody talked to them about Jesus Christ, they'd get saved. See, 
Jesus told us the problem is the harvest is great, but the laborers are few. We got too many people sitting back saying there's a line in the streets. I, I can't do it. I can't pass out tracks. I, I'd be embarrassed to talk to them and we let them die and go to hell all around us. Somebody's waiting. Just that God doesn't put a sign over their head to tell us this one is ready. You've got to just talk to many of them to find that one that's ready. There was a tourist who came to a beautiful garden in Switzerland. He stood at the gate waiting for someone to come and show him around. Finally, an aged man came in and he asked him, uh, how long have you been here and who's your boss? The man told him, he said, well, I've been here 24 years and I have seen my boss four times. So he said, you mean you keep this garden as though your boss was coming tomorrow? He said, no, I keep it as though he's coming today. We're to be working for Jesus as though, as though he's coming today. Because he could come today. We know he's coming. He just didn't tell us today. You know why? I think one of the reasons he didn't tell us what day it was he was coming, because there are a lot of slackers who would just simply sit back and wait till the last day and then get busy for God. He didn't want us to wait till the last day. He wants us busy now. We ought to be winning the loss. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 6, 2, Behold, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. What a horrible thing for our lost loved ones who'd be left behind. There are people here. You've got people that you love, that you know are lost. And you take some comfort in the fact that it doesn't appear they're going to die anytime soon. But you realize if Jesus came today, they're going into the tribulation time. You realize that. And if you've witnessed to them before, they will die lost in the tribulation time. God will see to it. Say, man, I just kind of embarrassed to talk to him again. Well, better to be embarrassed now than to find out they died and went to hell because you didn't talk to him now. Wow. Samuel Chadwick in the early 1900 asked this question. Why does the church stay indoors? They have a theology that dwindled into a philosophy in which there is no thrill of faith, no terror of doom, and no concern for souls. Unbelief has put out the fires of passion, and worldliness gar uh, garlands that altar of sacrifice with the tawdry glitter of unreality. Most of us here would say amen to this teaching that Jesus is coming again, but we live like it couldn't possibly be today. We know better. But we live, and by our lives, we tell the world, basically, don't worry about it. We've got other things we need to do. Single person, maybe the thing on your mind is getting an education and hopefully finding a wife. Well, that's fine, but single person, you need to be serving Jesus today. Young married couples, I understand getting wrapped up in your new spouse and all that, and I'm not going to say you're going to get over it, and I hope you don't. But you ought to start out serving Christ. And you ought to start out serving Him together. And then a lot of young couples, they start having kids, and suddenly now they're too busy to serve Jesus. And they've got all the things they want their kids to experience. Well, how about them experiencing a mom and dad serving Jesus? To be brought up in that kind of a home. Man, what a blessing that'd be. By the way, I thought of something else we ought to be doing. We ought to be giving to missions. You know, I don't know how much longer that the U.S. dollar is going to be able to be used in mission work. It seems like every day this last week, the price of gold went higher every day, which meant simply that the dollar is getting less every day. Brother Borf, way back when, when you got your first car, how much did it cost? That must have been a fine car. Now, some of you can go back to the 1950s and you got a car for 200 bucks, 300 bucks, 400 bucks that ran great. And by the way, back then, you're talking about gas probably being 20 cents to a quarter. 
a gallon. I'd say the dollar's not worth as much as what it was back then. Wouldn't you say so? What happens? What happens if we get under a one world economy? Could happen before Jesus comes. I hope not, but it could happen. What happens if the dollar totally tanks? I mean, we end up having a dollar much like they had the German mark before World War II, where people had to go get their money every hour and carry it away in wheelbarrows because it'd be worth less even after that. Get it? We said, I can't, we can't imagine things like, how? I'll tell you what I think about when I think about that type of scene. How are we going to support missions? If we're going to reach the world, we've got to do it today. Now's the time to be given. Someone said, given while you're living because you're knowing where it's going. We wait till it's too late. He said, man, no, we've got to save it. Yeah, for it to wither away in the bank. And let souls die and go to hell so I could be at ease later on? I don't think so. I'm not, I'm not complaining about having some money in the bank. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Man, we ought to be giving people for missions. People are dying and going to hell. And it's our responsibility to reach them around the world. We better start getting concerned about reaching Muslims. I was reading an article the other day. Do you realize that there are many... European cities today that over 40% of the population in those cities is Muslim? Europe. I'm not talking about Saudi Arabia. I'm not talking about Iran and Iraq. I'm talking about Europe. And Islam is growing fast in the United States. While we ignore them, they grow. You know, I'll tell you something better. Better than taking... The gun to defend our faith would be to take the Bible to them and get them saved. That's what we're called to do. They need the gospel like the Buddhist does. They need the gospel like the occult do in Papua New Guinea. They, now's the time for us to be sending the missionary. The need's greater than ever before as the population has increased. Because you see, when Jesus comes back, we're done. Jesus comes back, all our missionaries are going up. We're going up. Now's the time to be busy for Him. The imminency of Christ. Do you really believe it could be tonight? Your life shows whether or not you believe it. Your life does. Are you saved? If you're a church member but not really born again, you would be left behind. And probably take some comfort in the fact you'd be able to look around the auditorium and see some others that are still here. It must have been something else. And I can only imagine. I can only imagine the TV saying, yeah, those people were taken out in judgment. God was tired of their fundamentalist ways. That'd be their excuse. They were so unloving. They weren't tolerant of anybody. And so God judged them by taking them out. And the world will believe it. They'll believe it. Hey, man, they believe in all those space creatures. After all these years, they believe in all those space creatures. The devil's had a pretty easy time deceiving people there. They'll have no trouble after the rapture. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Dear Lord, if there's one here without Christ, may they come to the Savior tonight. As believers, may we allow the Spirit of God to deal with our heart. May we allow the Spirit of God to search out our heart that we be willing to get right about anything in our lives that are not right with you. And Father, may we get active and fervent in the service of our Lord. Truth is, whatever the ministry is, we ought to always have an excess number of people willing to do something for God. Have your way in our hearts, in our church tonight, I pray in Jesus' name. Let's stand to our feet with heads bowed.